We are here because we know the outcomes in our lives are within our control. That taking absolute ownership of how we eat, sleep, train, think, and connect with each other is how we'll optimize our health and happiness. That chasing excellence is how we grab hold of what is possible. Our mission is to live on the run, always chasing, never stop. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Chasing Excellence, Ben. We are joined today by Ron Friedman. Ron, how are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Good. Thanks so much for joining us. Ron, you're an award-winning social psychologist, founder of Ignite AD, a learning and development company, translating research uh, research in ne neuroscience, human physiology, and behavioral economics into practical strategies for working professionals. You are also, and the reason why you are here today, you're also the author of a new book, Decoding Greatness, subtitle, How the Best in the World Reverse Engineer Success. I'm excited to talk to you about this. First question for you, reverse engineering. I'd love to make sure that, that we have a good sense of what that is, what it means, what it isn't. And so really broad first question for you, if you could just kind of give us a sense of when you say reverse engineering, when you when you went in and to, to write this book, what is the difference in your mind between reverse engineering and copying somebody, reverse engineering and being inspired by somebody, reverse engineering and fill in the blank? What specifically is reverse engineering that is different or deeper or more valuable than, oh, yeah, like I like what he does. So I just kind of tried to do what he did. Yeah, great question. And first, let me give you some context about you know why I wrote this book. And, and, and the idea behind this book was that the stories we've been told about success and top performance are wrong. Most of us grew up with two basic stories about how people achieve at the highest levels. The first story is that greatness comes from talent. This is the idea that we're, you're born with a, a certain set of strengths, and your job is to figure out what you're really good at and then find a field where you can allow those strengths to shine. The second big story, is that greatness comes from practice. This is the Malcolm Gladwell idea, the 10,000 hours school, the, the, the idea that if you just have the right practice regimen and you have enough discipline to carry through with that practice regimen for years and years and years, that eventually you'll become great. In doing the research for decoding greatness, what I discovered is that there's a third story, and it's one that people don't often talk about, yet it is the path through which a remarkable array of luminaries, people who are entrepreneurs, artists, marketers have reached the top of their profession, and that is reverse engineering. So what is reverse engineering? Reverse engineering simply means finding an extraordinary example in your field and then systematically unpacking it, working backward to figure out how it is that that person succeeded. So the difference to answer your question between it's being influenced by and reverse engineering or copying and reverse engineering is reverse engineering is a methodical approach to an analyzing what it is that makes a particular example successful. If you choose to copy that exact approach, chances are, I would argue, you're not going to be as successful as you would be if you evolved that formula in, 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 a, in, a, in a slight way. And it's because audience expectations tend to shift with time. And so if you're reproducing somebody else's work a year later, you're going to be late to the game. What people want is something that feels familiar but is slightly unique. And so reverse engineering is having a technique that allows you to really uh, analytically take apart what it is that makes something resonate and then apply that in a new way or even combine it with somebody else's approach. So now you're creating something that is creative and your own. That's super, um, I love that approach because it's something that we talk about a lot actually is this idea versus like inborn talent. You were born to do this and, you know, Michael Phelps, thank God he got in a pool at some point and Usain Bolt, so, so lucky he found or track spikes and then there's the other people that, you know, hone their craft through the 10,000 hour, hours of deep, deep practice. But this reverse engineering is kind of like um, stealing someone's blueprints. It's stealing somebody's um, – the, the method and the process. So how does somebody – and you write about this kind of – you give some really good examples of this. But how does somebody go about um, finding – a master in the field and then breaking down not only their work, but their process. Mm. How does somebody, um, cause it's not necessarily not just about the work always it's cause in our field, like an athlete, like if you want to find out about the, the athlete, it's, well, it's, it's just the performance on the field. Mm -hmm. So how do you, how does somebody go about like kind of pulling back the curtain and finding out what this person's actually doing to get as great as they are? So first, let me just say that 
this process of reverse engineering isn't to suggest that talent doesn't matter and that mm -hmm. practice doesn't matter. Both of those things can absolutely help. But if you're relying on just your talent or if you're relying on just practice, you're going to fall short. And it's primarily because if you're if it takes 10,000 hours to become great at something some would argue that it doesn't take that long but even if you're if you're saying it's half that let's say it's 5,000 hours by the time you get really good at mastering something after 5,000 hours chances are the field has evolved and that skill that you've mastered may no longer be as relevant the other part of it is that there's a glaring problem with the issue of just practicing and it's because you can't practice an idea you've never considered you don't come up with ideas by practicing in isolation. It's by looking at the masters and figuring out what they're doing differently that you get those big ideas that help you make that big leap in your performance. When it comes to athletes, uh, there's a couple of different things that you can do. One of them is obviously to interview the athlete. We're now living in an age where we have access to more people than ever before, whether it's having a podcast like this, becoming a, a blogger, um, or just hiring someone as a consultant. That's obviously one methodology, but you need to have the right questions in Decoding Greatness. In Chapter 7, I give you that list of questions so that you understand how actually to go about interviewing somebody who has condensed so much of what they're doing and is just largely unconscious. If we were to interview for example, uh, Novak Djokovic about how to serve, we would probably get an incomplete answer. And it's because research shows that once you become an expert in a particular area, 70% of your actions and your thoughts become unconscious. So even if I asked you to tell me everything about delivering a podcast, you'd give me 30% of that information. So the key is to interview multiple experts because when you interview multiple experts, more pieces of the puzzles become uh, obvious. The other thing I would say is that this methodology is a lot more relevant to knowledge work than it is to athletic performance. When it comes to knowledge work, you don't have to have access to the writer of the TED Talk or the author of the book or the director of the film. You can reverse engineering by, by looking at their end product and then having so, and, and applying some of the tools in this book to break down what is happening so that you can apply it to your work. And I'll give you an example just to make this concrete. One of my favorite examples in the book is how Kurt Vonnegut, the famous writer, would reverse engineer famous stories. And here's how he did it. He would turn words into a picture. And so he would take a story and he would graph out over time, how are the protagonist's fortunes going? In other words, how are things going for the main character? Are things going well? Are things going poorly? And so on the x-axis from left to right, he's got from the beginning of the story to the end of the story. On the y-axis from the top to the bottom is how are things going? Are things going well? Are things going poorly? And so by the end of the story, he's got himself like an x-ray for the book. He's got a, a single image that captures the cadence and the emotional tenor of the book. And what he discovered while doing that is if you do this for lots and lots and lots of stories, you uh, come to realize that there are only six basic stories. And often we're told the same story in different contexts and we don't even realize it. So there's a great example in the book uh, where he compares Cinderella against uh, the, the movie version of Annie. And what you find when you compare those two is the same story. Both of them uh, start off. The main character is struggling at the beginning. Cinderella's in the basement uh, being abused by her stepsisters. Annie is an orphan being harangued by Miss Hannigan. Then something good happens. Cinderella gets invited to the ball. Annie gets rescued by Daddy Warbucks. Then something bad happens. The clock strikes midnight. Annie gets kidnapped by people pretending to be her parents. And then finally, there's a climax and they live happily ever after. It's the same story. We don't even realize it because it's a completely different context. But when you have this methodology of stepping back, zooming out, seeing the big picture, all of a sudden you come to recognize patterns that can be applied in uniquely new ways. Yeah, I love it. you. You talk about it. The same thing is the Harry Potter and Star Wars. That's right. Exactly right. Taken away from the aunt and the uncle, the hero's journey, find magical powers, the struggle along the way. So it, it is really interesting to hear like the similarities. And I think that you say that there's Vonnegut found like six different. They're all everything basically falls into six different categories. Exactly. And you know uh, what? The, what's really remarkable is that this applies to our work too. So that seems mm. that might you listen to this, you might think, oh, that's great for authors. It doesn't apply to me. Right. Well, it's the same patterns in TED talks and in in winning presentation decks and in, um, in phenomenal sales pitches. If you can crack the code, you can templatize it and start applying it to create new works. But what, one of the things that you mentioned in there is that it's not just about cracking the code and templatizing. You have to bring your own – because if I try to give the TED Talk in a humorous way, it's not going to come across as well because I might not be as funny as Sir Kensington or whoever – 
Ken Robinson. Ken Kensington. Ken Robinson. Sir Kensington is the mustard. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'm not going to give a TED Talk as well as that delicious, sweet mustard. <laughs> But that's right. But but your, to your point, I love that, is like, let's crack the code. Let's make it formulaic. But that's not the end of the journey. Right. And as you said, with all of this stuff, it is create the blueprint. It is decode it. But then there's an evolution that you need to bring to it as well. Yeah. And I think part of that evolution can come either from very deliberately modifying the formula, but at the same time, in many cases, your unique experience and background is going to make it different enough from the original that you will come across as unique. Mm. What you don't want, however, is to find a formula that works for someone else that you then try to apply to yourself and all of a sudden you come across as inauthentic. Uh, because people see that, see right through that and that's not going to work. So the key is to either be deliberate in evolving someone else's formula to make it your own or to find the right formula that really you need, that really uh, uh, works for you. So you um, you start off the book with this amazing, captivating story that that really gives a lot of credence to this decoding power because people look at people like Steve Jobs as this visionary, completely innovative, changed the world forever. And his counterpart in Bill Gates as well. Can you give kind of like the the Cliff Notes version of that story? Because it truly shows to me. It just like it 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 really brings to light what we mean by this decoding, and then bringing it to your own, bring it through your own lens as well. Yeah, I appreciate you bringing that up. So there is this fascinating story that unless you are deep into tech or into uh, business reading, you probably haven't heard it. And it's the story of of the foundation of of Apple and Matt and uh, Microsoft and the connection that they both share around a product that existed before either of those companies really broke out. And so back in the late 70s, early 80s, computers looked nothing like the sleek, intuitive devices that we now use. If you wanted a computer to do anything, you had to reach for a keyboard and input a very rigid text-based language called syntax. That's how computers worked. Today, of course, we don't work that way. We have a mouse that allows us to point and click on visuals. That innovation was, uh, the, was introduced by Xerox, the photocopy company that's based in Rochester, New York, they had a computer called the Xerox Alto that they didn't realize could be sold to consumers. They thought this is going to be a uh, very expensive product that would be sold to very elite corporations that had lots and lots of money. And both Steve Jobs and Bill Gates saw demonstrations of the Xerox Alto and then went back to their offices and reverse engineered it. In other words, they worked backward to figure out how it worked. And th they didn't copy code. So the idea that, okay, they just stole somebody else's innovation doesn't hold credence. They didn't copy anything. What they did was they worked backward. They said to themselves, okay, if I wanted to create a machine that worked like this, how would I go about doing it? And then they took that idea and didn't sell copies of the Alto. They evolved it in different directions. In the case of Microsoft, they focused on making computers a affordable. In the case of Apple, they worked on making computers user-friendly and artistic. And so both of them took an underutilized idea and applied it in new directions. And that is what led to their enormous success was through reverse engineering. So we tell ourselves stories about these creative geniuses, right? Or people who have worked in their field for years and years and years. And actually reverse engineering holds a much better and more concise explanation for why those two succeeded. Yeah, I think... I I love that what you highlight, which is this level of um, – it's kind of one of the differentiations between entrepreneurs and the employees, which is this level of curiosity. Mm -hmm. And the, the entrepreneur – and I, I'm, I'm an entrepreneur and I – this really like was one of those like light bulb moments for me when I was reading the book that like, oh my gosh, this is what I do. When I go to a restaurant, I'm there – analyzing the restaurant. It's there. I'm like trying to bring home – the level of what's the front desk experience like and can I bring that to my business, which is running a gym. I'm trying to figure out the ambiance and the way that people greet each other and I'm trying to constantly pull from these other endeavors to figure out is this something I can beg, borrow, or steal or is this not applicable? And that level of pulling from whether I'm going to a sporting event, whether I'm going to a restaurant, whether I'm going to a library, what every time I'm navigating the world, I'm constantly trying to like it like pull out the best practices, mm -hmm. even if it's seemingly completely devoid of 
um, the parallels that you might see originally, which is like, it has nothing to do with athletics. It has nothing to do with fitness. It has nothing to do with health and wellness. Why would you possibly, but that level of curiosity really struck me in the way that you broke down the differences between the way that entrepreneurs and employees kind of think through things. Can you, um, kind of expand upon that? Yeah, absolutely. So there's research out of the Harvard Business School looking at what is it that differentiates wildly successful entrepreneurs, people like uh, Branson and uh, Steve Jobs and, and uh, Jeff Bezos. What is it that differentiates them from middle managers? And what they found in the study was that it's not necessarily higher levels of creativity or greater intelligence or even more drive. What it is, is the capacity for asking questions, the desire to find out more, the curiosity. And why that matters is because one of the key differentiators between entrepreneurs and middle managers is that entrepreneurs, in addition to questioning more, they're also far better at identifying patterns. And why that's helpful is because they're able to spot a pattern that works in one time or area or context and how it could be applied to their specific location and time and context. So a great example of this is, uh, I discussed this in uh, Decoding Greatness, how if you look at Chipotle and you look at Starbucks, on the surface, those two have nothing in common. But in fact, they're both based on the same business model. And that business model has to do with finding an idea or a product or a service that resonates in one place and then importing it into your hometown. In the case with Starbucks, uh, uh, um, Howard Schultz goes off to Italy, sees the coffee bar, the espresso bars in Milan, and then brings it back to Seattle. In the case of Chipotle, Steve Ells, who's living in San Francisco, sees these burrito bars everywhere and thinks to himself, huh, I wonder if this will take off in Colorado, and he founds Chipotle. And so in both of those cases, the question is, what is working somewhere else that I can bring into my hometown? Now, when you have that formula, when you have that blueprint, all of a sudden, you can come up with tons of ideas. All you have to do is go travel around, see what's working in different from places and start experimenting with bringing that into your hometown or vice versa, figure out what's working for you in your hometown that you can export somewhere else. So it's not about necessarily coming up with a million ideas. It's about finding the blueprint that you can then build off and then riff off and then come up with your ideas that way. And there's this um, kind of this sweet spot in terms of newness mm -hmm. or this um, innovation level where if it's, as we said in the beginning of the conversation, if it's just copying, it's just copying. But if it's so new, um, you know, it gets, it's, it's, it's before it's time. So there's this kind of like, uh, just bring a new flair to it. Am yeah. I saying that right? Yeah. So the, the official, uh, terminology, this is the one, this is the quote that was given by the researcher who did this study was optimal newness. So what you're looking for, the is optimal the, level of newness. Correct. Correct. Yeah. So this is research looking at the, uh, it, at the type of medical uh, grants that get approved by government agencies. And so what they did in this study, this is again, Harvard uh, uh, researchers, they looked at uh, the types of grants that get submitted into places like the NIH. And then they, they had experts rate them on their level of creativity. And then they looked at which are the ones that actually got funding. And what they found was the ones that were replicating previous studies, those got rejected. They weren't new enough. The ones that were wildly new, those got rejected. They didn't get funded either. The, the the studies that got funding were the ones that were moderately new, meaning optimal newness, which is you want to take an idea that is kind of established, but you want to riff on it slightly so that it is evolved a little bit. And so in the book, I talk about how Don Draper, famous creative director for Sterling Cooper in uh, the show um, Mad Men, he talked about... Uh, 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 derivative with a twist. That was his quote. You want derivative with a twist. Now, derivative is obviously a negative word. You don't want to be derivative. But if you could put your twist on it, it's new enough that it'll work. And there's all kinds of research showing that this actually is the case where if you're too new, you miss the mark. If you're not new enough, people get bored. They don't, they look past you. So you want to be just slightly new. And there's all kinds of historical examples about ideas that were extremely new getting rejected. For example, anesthesia was a medical practice mm. that most people did not accept at the beginning. And it was because there was this concern that if you were unconscious in the presence of a doctor, that that was immodest. That was, that was not proper behavior. And so that was rejected for many years. And it's also in the case of newer inventions. If you think about, like I talk about in the book about Uber and um, 
uh, uh, in DoorDash, uh, Uber Eats and DoorDash are obviously very popular right now, but there was a service in the 1990s called Takeout Taxi that did not take off. And it was because people were like, I don't know, pay, get, ordering food to deliver to my house from a restaurant. That sounds crazy. If it's at least if it's not yeah. calling the, re the restaurant directly. Same thing with the Apple Watch. You know, I love my Apple Watch. I have all kinds of great metrics that I collect there. And uh, the smartwatch was not invented by Apple. The first smartwatch was introduced by Seiko. And then there was one by Microsoft. And even 20 years ago, they were already delivering traffic information and sports scores and weather. And they still did not take off. We needed the intermediate point of having the smartphone to make it make to, 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 to make us comfortable with the idea of getting our information on the go in that way. And obviously, the Apple Watch is incredibly popular today. That's a good segue. Good job, Ron. Because I wanted to talk to you about the scoreboard principle, and you mm -hmm. mentioned all the metrics that your that your Apple Watch allows you to collect. So I, I want to segue into uh, this section of the book that, again, you call the scoreboard principle. Um, and can you just give us a, a high level sense of what what that principle is, and and where does it fit into this conversation around reverse engineering? Yes. Yeah, so the first half of the of reverse of decoding greatness is all about how. People in various fields have been reverse engineering for generations, how you can apply that practice to your field, and then how you can evolve winning formulas to make them your own. The second half of the book is once you have those winning formulas, once you know what it is you're trying to achieve, how do you actually get good at it? Because even if you have somebody else's winning formula, that doesn't mean you're going to be good at it right out of the gate. Chances are it's going to take some time for you to improve your skills. So what does the research tell us about uh, bridging the gap between our vision and our ability. And that's the second half of the book. The first chapter in that second half is called the scoreboard principle. And what the scoreboard principle simply states is that if you want to improve at anything, the first step is to capture metrics because you will improve on anything that you measure. And there's research showing that if you are on a diet and you keep track on a food diary of the food that you consumed, you will lose more weight than another person who's on the same exact diet, but isn't keeping a food diary. So the question is why? Why would you lose more weight? And it's because by keeping track of your key metrics, in this case, your calorie intake, you pay more attention to your decisions around what it is you consume. Uh, beyond that, you're more mindful and you're just better at finding leading indicators of what it is that leads you to take certain actions and what doesn't. And so keeping score is pivotal to improving at anything. There's all kinds of evolutionary reasons for this. If you didn't pay attention to numbers in the historical past, you would, you're likely not to have survived. So for example, if you weren't very keenly attuned to how many people belong to a group, you would you wouldn't know who to ally with or who to steer clear of, right? So knowing that was key. Um, there's all, I can go all I can totally uh, nerd out with you about the the evolutionary reason for metrics. But the key is, unless you have your own metrics, you're going to fall to prey to somebody else's metrics. That's the thing that people don't realize. So this is why. Yeah. All kinds of apps have numbers on them, like scores that have nothing to, it's not even a game, right? Like I'll go on to an app that has, I don't know, chess or whatever. Like it's, chess is a bad example because it is a game, but Zillow mm -hmm. uh, will, will give you all kinds of scores sometimes. Um, and mm -hmm. so they know that if you keep, that, that you are, uh, uh, you can't help but be attracted to a scoreboard. And so they're using that to manipulate your behavior. Um, and, but if you, develop your own metrics, you get far better at ignoring other people's metrics because now you know what you're actually accountable to. So having metrics for what it is you're trying to achieve is key to improvement. How do you determine what are the key metrics? What are the leading indicators versus maybe not as productive numbers to, that are distractions? Well, it really depends on what it is you're trying to achieve. So let me give you an example. In my case, I might be focused on what it is that makes me successful at work, right? So the key is you, you don't want to start off with a ton of metrics. I've seen people like really go off the deep end with this, like keeping 50 metrics. But if you can identify like three key metrics that make for a successful day, you're already halfway there. So in my case, it might be word count if I'm, a, if I'm in writing mode. It might be... Um, how many minutes, uninterrupted minutes I have during the day where I'm not distracted or doing a multitasking, keeping track of those minutes can keep me focused. And maybe it's about, you know, if I'm uh, doing some lead gen is how many clients that I speak with. Having those numbers gives me a scoreboard and all of a sudden it can't help but be addicted to that. I want to beat yesterday's score. Or if I mm -hmm. didn't do so well today, I'm going to feel 
ashamed. That's good in some ways, right, to a point, <laughs> uh, because that'll motivate me to have a better day tomorrow. And so you're using that emotional uh, feedback loop to motivate you. But if you have no scoreboard, you have no idea how you're doing. How many of us go into work, come home, our kid asks us or our, our wife asks us, what did you do today at work? And you're like, I don't know. <laughs> I answered some emails. And you, you really have no sense for whether you're improving or not unless you're keeping score. What are some of the, we, you mentioned it, or we, we've alluded to it a little bit with leading indicators and obviously their flip of being lagging indicators. And I know in the book, you talk a little bit about vanity metrics. Mm. What are some of the pratfalls or the, the mistakes that you've seen people make? You, you know, again, you just mentioned another 50 metrics to, yeah. to, to try to track. How do people get this idea wrong? Um, because it's something that, you know, Ben and I actually just did an episode where we, we basically broke down. Ben's scoreboard, <laughs> for lack of a better way to put it. We didn't call it that, but effectively that's what it was. And so for folks out there who have this in the back of their mind, for our listeners, what what are the things that we want to avoid doing and and why, do, why does that lead us to either abandoning the scoreboard or, or focusing on the wrong thing entirely? Yeah, this is, we could probably have a whole episode on this, but one thing that I've seen people make a, a common mistake on is focusing on metrics they don't control. So, for example, uh, if you are – I'm trying to think of a way that I can make this example generic enough that it doesn't seem like it's about me. <laughs> because, <laughs> but, but if you're – for example, let's say – let's put, talk about business development and your focus is on deals closed. A lot of that is out of your control. Now, that's not to suggest that you shouldn't at all pay attention to deals closed, but what you should focus on are the behaviors that are in your control that will lead you to a positive outcome, like how many calls did you make? How many meetings did you hold? How many qualified leads did you have conversations with? Those types of metrics will focus you on the behaviors that will help you achieve your result. If you're, on the other hand, if you're focused on something that isn't necessarily going to lead to a positive result, like deals closed, you know, that's not in your control what, what a particular client is going to do. You're going to go home feeling depressed a lot of the time because how often do deals close, right? Maybe you're in a business where you just have to sell three times a year in order to have enough revenue to support your business. So I, I, having controllable metrics is one thing I would say. Having too many metrics is another thing that is problematic because – if, if you're spending a large portion of your day just looking at your scoreboard, I'm going to argue that that is counterproductive. A third thing is mm -hmm. focusing on negative um, – focusing on the negative things as opposed to positive things. I'll give you a story. When I was younger, I um, – it was in my 20s. I was sick for a while. And so the doctor asked me to keep track of every time I had a stomach ache. <laughs> so that was a bad metric to keep hold, track of because I'm constantly looking for the negative I'm, as opposed right. to looking for the positive. You want to focus yourself on positive behaviors or positive outcomes that you're looking to achieve. And even if you're not necessarily getting 100% every day, because those are top of mind, you're going to be more positive oriented in your mood. Mm -hmm. What about um... – I think it's Goodhart's law, which basically says like once once a um, a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure. How yeah. do you how do you how do you make sure that you're not you don't pick a you don't pick an objective or you don't pick a metric or whatever, and that ends up pointing you in the wrong direction? Yeah. So just to make this concrete, there's a, so, so the 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 uh, example you just pointed out, Goddard's Law, is is like you, people start gaming the system. This is the problem with a lot of police metrics. Is like they don't – like I, I had – I went to Brooklyn and uh, somebody stole something out of my car. So I went to the police station to uh, report it and they were trying to convince me for quite some time that a crime had not been committed because they didn't want to report it because it makes the precinct look bad to have to report those crimes. And I, I can mm. totally appreciate where they're coming from because they're going to – they're going to – it's going to look to them like they didn't – to their boss like they didn't do a good job. So they're trying to avoid that. That's an example of a metric going awry where you're no longer paying attention to what the metric is supposed to measure. You're just trying to be successful at the metric. A, 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 a corollary to that is in my life, I had a Fitbit for a while and I was, you know, like everybody else trying to get to 10,000. And I'd go uh, to shop at the supermarket and I noticed one time that I was not using my right hand to carry the cart 
and I, uh, because I wouldn't get the the points, right? So I was using my left hand, and and I need that hand in order to play racquetball. And I would I was like exacerbating my elbow injury, but I needed the points. So it was okay to do it, right? So that's another example of, of metrics going awry. And the answer to it is to 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 evolve your metrics with time. You're going to find yourself gaming the system sometimes and when that happens like if you're if you're counting how many words you're writing per day as a writer you might just write a, a, a paragraph that you know is not going to stand just so you can meet your goal of 500 words um and so you want to evolve your metrics with time as you see yourself gaming the system <laughs> you want to evolve that metric the other thing that i often recommend for organizations for example i'm working with an organization right now and developing their culture metric is not just to uh not just to capture positive metrics, but also to identify if that metric is if, – if we're doing too well on this metric, what would that negative outcome look like? So, for example, if you're optimizing for sales, if you're generating a whole bunch of great leads – that's fantastic. But if you're generating a whole bunch of leads that are not converting, you probably have low quality leads. So you want to evolve that metric, not just to number of leads, but rather to high quality leads. My my son, when he, he had a Fitbit for a while and I came in to put him to bed one night and I see, saw him laying in bed, just moving <laughs> yes. his arm up and down. Yep. I was like, what are you doing? He's like, I got to beat Harley, and his, his sister. He's like, I got to beat her. So like, it's just, it was just... A, you're laying down like hits of all about the metrics. It's when the metrics lose their meaning. But yeah. and, but you know what? That just goes to show how powerful metrics are. Even when it's yeah, something right. as meaningless as like what the Fitbit tells me I did, we become obsessed with it. So yeah. that, that that's why I argue in the book that unless you have the right metrics, you're not going to get anywhere. But beyond that, it's it's remarkable that so many people don't have their metrics. It sounds like, Ben, like you have your metrics but and you're halfway there. But this is the one of the key takeaways from the book is reverse engineer your best day or your best life and hold yourself accountable by measuring your performance on those metrics. With the holding yourself accountable, is there um, any data or anything you found that shows that like the accountability buddy system that when you make them public versus – because I've seen it both ways in my own personal life, which is – when I when I share them, yes, there's more. I, I know I'm going to be responsible for reporting these. But then there's the flip side of like, well, if they're not doing it and they fall off, and it's then That's I great fall point. off. And yeah, great point. So there's research that if you uh, if you if you do publicize it, you tend to do a little bit better. I I believe, and I think we're going to have studies showing this, that there is a personality component to this that hasn't been looked at yet, which is it works for some people, but other people actually do worse when it goes public because yeah. then they feel a lot of pressure or whatever the case may be in your case, where if your buddy falls off, now all of a sudden you feel like you can fall off as well. I don't think it's as clear cut as that. Yeah. I, th I like that, the, the pressure aspect to it, because I think that's what people mistake as well is they, um, you know, everyone's been told like the, the smart goal thing has been at nauseum. Um, but what ends up happening is when they create these smart goals is they can be too, um, uh, maybe like, again, like you said, outside your goal, outside, sorry, outside your uh, control, which leads to a lot of pressure. And then when they have one little slip, they're like, oh, well, there that goes instead yeah. of these more process oriented. And the, the goal is just to stick with this process. And that yeah. seems to have, yeah. I, th I think what you're getting at is that the you know, the autonomy is lost. It feels now controlling. I have to do this because it says I have to do this mm -hmm. where you for yourself may have um, evolved your perspective of it, or maybe you're having a bad day and you're not really being as um, understanding of yourself as would be optimal. It's, it's really remarkable how much better we treat other people sometimes um, than when we're judging ourselves. The, the other thing one of the other things from the book that I really wanted to talk to you about is something that you call practicing in three dimensions, mm -hmm. the three dimensions being the past, the present and the future. And you're right. Research now shows that our performance on both mental and physical tasks improves dramatically when we expand our definition of practice to the way athletes have utilized practice for decades. Can you unpack what practicing in three dimension looks like, especially uh, maybe in influenced and inspired by athletes, but for non-athletic pursuits, whether it's personal life, whether it's business, whether it's whatever? Absolutely. So, you know, the, the, when we think about practice, most of us think about practicing in the present, which is doing the same task over and over repeatedly, and then utilizing the feedback we get to improve in the future. That can be helpful, provided that you're doing it correctly. Um, 
But there are other dimensions to practice that don't often get discussed outside of sports. And the first is practicing in the past. And so this gets termed in the literature as reflective practice, which means taking a look at the tape. For example, an athlete might look at the tape and look to see what they did well, what they didn't do well, what they can improve the next time. We could all do the same, even when we don't have the actual objective tape. Here, the way you can do this is by either journaling or by taking the time at the end of the day to figure out what, what went well, what didn't go well, what can I do better this time. Another great question is if I had this day to relive, what would I do differently? And when you do that on a daily basis, what happens is you get a lot better at noticing patterns inside your life, but also predicting what you can be doing better in the future. So one of my favorite tools for this, I talk about this in the book, is the five-year journal. And how the five-year journal works is it's got the five slots on the same day. And you indicate when you're inputting this is what year it is. And so it's basically you're carrying this for five years. And so you're just writing in a few short lines what it is you did today, what it is you learned today. And then uh, you do this for every day in the year, and then after a year, when you go back to that same date, you get to enter what you did on this day, but then you also get to see what you did on that exact same day the previous year. I've been, whole, I've been doing this for a few years now, and it's just remarkable how much you learn about yourself, how much you can predict uh, in advance. What I like to do often is, for example, last night, today is uh, Thursday, so I look to see what it is I did on this Thursday the previous year, and often what you find is that, you know, particularly with holidays, it's you almost like giving yourself a preview of what the tomorrow could be. Mm. And you get to avoid a lot of the mistakes um, and uh, can make better decisions on how to utilize your time. And I, in the book, what? I talk about, yeah. I was going to say, what did you do last? What did you last year this Thursday? <laughs> you know what? It was, it was a work day. So I don't think there was anything particularly remarkable. But this is why I say about holidays. I think the holiday one is really useful because I'll read about New Year's Day in advance of New Year's Day. Or I'll read about the 4th of July in advance of the 4th of July. And, um, you know, I'll, sometimes um, – I, this is kind of a, a silly example, but one of the things that I discovered is that if you, you know, I, I, it, it really is a silly example, but I'll share it anyway, is I, often I will visit family in New York City. I live in Rochester, New York, so it's a six-hour um, car ride. And uh, often when I would, I used to do this, I'd come back after the six-hour car ride and I'd feel so grateful to be at home, uh, you know, the comfort of your own house, and I'd want to go grill. So I'd go to, the, I'd go shop, get a steak or whatever, grill it. And, uh, and then uh, the night would be over. And what I realized over time is I, I, I literally write myself notes for future Ron. <laughs> so remember this, do not cook after driving the car for six hours because mm. it'll, it'll lengthen your night by four hours. It's just not worth it. So the point is you're mm. constantly finding these little clues about how you can improve your time and avoid pitfalls. In Decoding Greatness, I talk about how I was about to hire this consultant who I'd worked with in the past, had mixed results. Through the five-year journal, I was about... I, I, came across a uh, an entry where I wrote, this guy is not to be trusted, don't work with him again. And I was able to avoid that mistake. So you're perfect. not only are you learning more things about yourself, identifying patterns, you're strengthening your memories for past events, but you're better able to identify mistakes that you can avoid in the future. So that's reflective pa uh, uh, practice, using the past to improve in the present. Practicing the future is imagery, is getting into the position as athletes would do before a big game and just seeing themselves in the in their mind's eye actually playing the game and visualizing those positive outcomes you can do the same thing in advance of a major talk or in advance of going into the office and what that does is it gives you a mental preview of what your day could be like and it empowers you to front load key decisions and because you're front loading decisions you're going to have a smoother day when you get to work because now you're not as surprised by some of the things that may pop up because you've visualized them and you've answered for them in advance. What do you mean by that front load decisions? Uh, so a great example of this might be, you know, if I've got a paper to write tomorrow at the office, right? So I start thinking, okay, uh, so it's, on the one hand, compared to somebody who hasn't front loaded any decisions, they just show up at the office, they try to write the paper. Whereas if I did this exercise of thinking through uh, what writing the paper might be like, I might remember that there's construction next door. I might uh, think about what are some uh, papers or books that I'm going to need in order to construct this draft. 
I might think about how uh, I might get really anxious about it. So I'm going to start taking some more walks. So now I've already thought through, okay, this is what I need to bring. This is uh, what I'm, I'm going to deal with the noise. And this is the snack I need to bring in order to keep myself on track. You compare that to that person who didn't do any of that. And that person is going to get to the office, be frustrated because it's loud, has to go back home to find those books. And then uh, as soon as they sit down to start writing, they're hungry. They have no snacks. So now you're front loaded those decisions so that you have a smoother um, uh, execution the following day. Take home message is always have snacks. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly right. Thank you for keying in on the important Ron, point there. Ron, is there, yeah, is there any research that shows um, kind of running the spectrum through visualization? Because when first came across visualization, it was always what you were kind of just alluding to is mm -hmm. imagine the perfect day. This is the day you could have. Imagine the perfect performance. This is the performance that you could have. And through that repetition, you're more likely to execute through that exact same thing. What I've seen working with my athletes is a lot of, I'm just wondering if there's any in the research that you've done, any validation to this, but researching, I'm sorry, um, but visualizing the negative as well. Not when you're walking onto the floor. When you're walking onto the floor, you want to be in a positive mindset. But running through the mental reps of if this goes wrong, this is what we'll do. And having plan B, C, and D. And so you're not surprised by the adversity. I guess you already kind of like, there's going to be construction next door. So you alluded to it a little bit. A hundred percent. So this is one of the things I, I talk about in the book is you don't want to just visualize success because then what happens when you get on stage, you walk onto the floor, if something goes bad, you're completely unprepared. <laughs> That's not good either. Uh, on the other hand, you don't want to just con just focus on the negative happening either. What you do want to do is you want to focus on things going wrong and then also, this is critical, visualize yourself getting out of it. What's your reaction? Mm -hmm. Think it through. And now you can see, not only do you have you front loaded those decisions, but you also have the confidence that you can deal with anything because you've seen it all and you've handled it. And then the last one is the one we always think about, which is just practicing in the present. What do you, what do you, what, what can we learn from? What can you bring out of the athletic uh, perception of practice to non-athletic endeavors? Well, one of the things that athletes have become really good at is cross-training. And the reason they cross-train is, A, because they don't want to overutilize the same muscles they need to use in a performance, but B, because sometimes you just get bored doing the same thing over and over again. And so they cross-train doing all kinds of different activities that can help elevate their game. Uh, and a great example of this is football players uh, taking ballet lessons, and it's because it contributes to balance and all kinds of positive physical activities, but don't have that grueling, uh, injury-prone uh, um, uh, characteristic that is uh, obviously the case for playing football all summer long. And uh, so how working professionals can use this is to think through what are some activities that I would enjoy that can help improve my performance at work. And I think that can lead you to all kinds of answers. It could lead the surgeon to play video games. It can lead the nervous salesperson to potentially do some karaoke. Uh, it, it, can, it can lead you to do some crosswords puzzles if you're a comedian for those unusual associations. Uh, I know that um, there are some writers who like to run. Uh, Malcolm Gladwell is a, is a good example of this. And there's the belief that if you can stick with something that's uncomfortable for a long period of time, that will benefit your writing because it obviously takes a really long time to write a book. And so getting comfortable with discomfort is key to that. And so uh, uh, what it comes down to is to think through what is it that might uh, benefit my performance at work that I actually enjoy doing. And just to, to round this out, another example of this is executives taking – um, they take stand-up comedy lessons, but they also take improv uh, lessons mm -hmm. as well. And it's because improv in particular requires presence. It requires thinking on your feet. Uh, it requires seeing creative solutions. All of that benefits their performance at the office. Uh, starting to wrap this up, actually, that's a good segue into the, a quote that I just want to kind of put out to you. We'll yeah. kind of let, let us wrap it up on this. And it's, when we look at the practice routines of those at the very top of their field, one thing stands out, a tireless pursuit of adversity, past, present, and future. It's because they know that progress without difficulty is impossible and that mastery is a destination, uh, isn't a destination, sorry, it's a way of life. Can you just talk about that a little bit, as well as what you just said, which is like, figure out what you enjoy doing. How do you balance those sometimes competing forces enjoy doing it. And, oh, it's also really hard. Enjoy, uh, improv, but it petrifies the crap out of me. Like, how do you, how do we start to navigate 
those sometimes contradictory ideas? You know, I, I think that we have heard a great deal about growth mindset. And a lot of us at this point, we've heard it so much that we kind of tune it out because it's just so, especially probably listeners to this podcast, I know you guys have talked about it before, but what it comes down to is an appreciation that if you're doing great at something, then you're probably not learning. And in the final chapter of the book, I talk about a comedian Aziz Ansari and his interview on NPR where he talks about how if he, if he has a great night at the comedy club and people are laughing, he feels, you know, surprisingly disenchanted. He's like, he's mm. disheartened by why everyone laughed. And, and that's a really weird place to be. But what you come to realize when you study these top performers is that they are addicted to that feeling of discomfort, of feeling like they're stretching, of feeling like they're, you know, for lack of a better term, chasing excellence, right? So <laughs> you need to get comfortable with that feeling of uh, being uncomfortable because it's the only way to grow and the only re way to reach the top of your uh, top of your field. Love it. I think it's a good place to wrap up. Yeah, so oh, terrific, so Ron. I really, really love that quote as well. That's a that's phenomenal. Thank yeah, you. The, the book again is called "Decoding Greatness: How the Best in the World Reverse Engineer Success." You can get it wherever you get your books. I do recommend it. Ben is holding it up. He recommends it as well. Ron, thank you so much for your time. Uh, thank you everybody out there for listening. Thank you for your ratings and your reviews. And Ben and I will be back for another episode next week. You can get every episode of Chasing Excellence wherever you listen to your podcasts or on YouTube. Until next time, thank you for listening.